Hey, welcome to Good News United Methodist Church. My name is Nikki, and we are so glad that you're joining us for worship today. In fact, if this is your first time to worship with us, we really would love to get to know you better and help get you and your family connected to the different ministries and the community that's here for you at Good News. So one way you can help us with that is by going to our church website, goodnewschurch.life. In the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is a dialog box that you can click on any time during the week. Shoot us a message. Let us know how we can get in touch with you, and someone from our team will be in touch with you this week. Um, church family, we also miss you guys. We miss seeing you, and we would love to hear from you as well. So you can go on the website any time during the week. Click on that box. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know how we can be praying for you, and we'll also be in touch with you within the week. Um, I know that we're missing a lot of things in this season, and one thing we've really missed is taking the Lord's Supper together. And so we're excited to be able to offer that on the first Thursday of every month at our 12 o'clock chapel service. If you haven't been to our chapel service, it's a little bit of a stripped down worship service where there's music, a message. It's a little bit shorter, but it's just as meaningful. And we hope that if you would like to take communion with us this week, that you'll go online and register for that at goodnewschurch.life. So every year we do a blessing of the backpack, and we are so excited to get to offer that again this year. Now you've heard this line before. It's going to look a little different, but I want to promise you that it's going to be really awesome and maybe even better this year, right, Jess? Um, the kids and students ministry have put a lot of time and effort into this. It's going to be an amazing. It's going to be memorable and meaningful. You guys will come, load your kids up in the car, come on the campus. It's going to be a tour in the parking lot through different um, stops through along the way. People will be there to see you, celebrate you, and we would love to be able to pray for your students going into this next school year and all the things that are going on. We think that this would be the best way they could start their school year off. That's right. I just want to thank you for being continually generous with your finances, with your times, and with your talents, um, especially with everything that's going on, um, to help Good News UMC continue to help people build their lives on the reality of Christ. And I just want to remind you that there's three simple ways that you can continue to give. You can go to our website at goodnewschurch.life. You can Go on our Church Center app and click Giving at the bottom, or you can mail in a check um, to our church here at the front office. Now, if you wouldn't mind, let's go into the Lord in prayer over our gifts. Father, we just come before you so thankful and honored and humbled that we get to do ministry and that we get to be your hands and your feet, especially during this season when so many people need you more now than ever. So, Father, we are just so thankful that you have gifted us with this, that you have entrusted us with this. And so, Father, just bless these offerings that come in. Guide us, Father, to how we can use these gifts to help our community in the best possible way that is just there to glorify you. And so, Father, as we continue in worship this morning, we just lift your holy and precious name up. We come to honor you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's keep singing. Because he ain't done with us yet. This is our story.
at church. job to do here. We know that we are to praise you, that we are to uh, pursue you. We know that all of these truths are just sinking in, Father, that the church is not hindered by this even a little bit, that even the gates of hell are not going to prevail. So Lord, be in our worship. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and
Well, good morning, church. We're so glad that y'all are here joining us for worship this morning. And as we get started, I just want to say that this morning's message, um, good news for you, it might be a little short, but the other side of that, though, is I think as much as we're going to, you know, trim off in time, I think we're going to raise it up and challenge this morning. And um, I found this week to be a really challenging message for us, and I believe that um, God can do some great things through it today. And so I want to just challenge you right now to join me for a moment of prayer, and that we would just open our hearts up for God to do something in us this morning. We're going to be talking about this idea of confession. We're going to be talking about letting go of what is wrong and grabbing hold of what is right. And Paul uses those words in, in Romans chapter 12. And as we wrestle with that, we really want to focus for a little bit tonight and this morning on what it means to let go of that which is not good. And how can we make wrongs right? And how can we pursue more of what God has for us in this season? So I want to invite you to begin this time of prayer with me. So let's pray together. God, we come to you and um, we humble ourselves right now. And we ask Jesus that um, as people who we know are not perfect and as we um, come to you who are, that you would just begin to reveal to us the places where we have fallen short. And God, and maybe the places through this season of a lot of stress and a lot of challenges and a lot of changes and a lot of disruption, um, maybe the things that we've said, maybe some people that we have encountered and our actions and our interactions have been less than what you would have for us. And so Jesus, I just ask that right now you would take a moment and that you just begin to reveal to us some places that maybe we as your people need to go back and make some wrongs right. And so as we navigate through these next few minutes together, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us. And I pray that we, through your power, would have the courage to act. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, in 1995, I was in high school. And I had had this unique opportunity when I got done with eighth grade and was moving into my freshman year of high school to go and attend a Catholic high school in our small little community. And for a variety of reasons, it made a lot of sense and I was real excited about it. And so as I went into this season, one of the things that was unique is I'd never really been around anything to do with the Catholic church. And so I was really excited to learn about this and see this and experience it. And we had religion classes that were taught by different priests. And so one of my first religion classes was taught by a guy named Father Halfacre, and he was a great, great priest, wonderful, wonderful man who taught so many people. He's actually still serving at that high school. And so as we went through this time in this class one day, we were sitting there, and he comes into class, and he said, hey, one of the other priests was supposed to be covering confession over at the church, and he didn't show up, so we're going to have to go over there and cover for him. And I was like, cool, right? We get out of class. That's all good. And so we walk across the street to this little church called St. Columba, and you'll see a picture of it here. It's this beautiful sanctuary. And we come in and we sit in the pews and we're all just kind of hanging out as a class chatting about 10 of us max. And the priest walks over into this other room off the sanctuary and he hangs out there for a few minutes. And then he comes back and he says, Hey, looks like there's nobody here for confession. So y'all can do it during this class. And so y'all just take turns coming in. And when everybody's done, we'll head back to class. And I was like, okay, this is weird. Never done this before. Not really sure how this is going to go. And so I think maybe I can just lay low enough and I'm not going to have to like experience any of this and we'll just, everybody will go but me and he'll come out and we'll just walk back to class and he'll never know the difference. And so he goes through and everybody goes through the thing but me and I'm sitting here kind of panicking the whole time of like, what is this? What am I getting into? What am I going to have to do? What do I say? How does this go? And so everybody had went but me and I was like, cool. And he walks out and I'm like, awesome. We're just going to go back to class. This is going to be great. And he's like, Hey, uh, there's 10 of you and I've only seen nine of you. So whoever's left, come on back. And I was like, awesome. This is great. So never done this before, never experienced anything like this. And so I walk into this room and there's this big black curtain that's set up in one chair. So I assume that that's the chair I'm supposed to sit in. So I go over there and I sit down and I'm not really sure what to say. So I, I just kind of sit there for a minute. And then I hear somebody on the other side of the curtain who goes, hey. And I was like, Hey. And then we just sat there because I didn't know what to say. And he says, so how long has it been since your last confession? And I was like, at least 15 years. And I heard him kind of chuckle on the other side of the thing. And he says, so this is your first time here? And I was like, yes. And I'm like, I'm the only non-Catholic kid in the class. Not sure why we have this curtain up because I'm pretty sure you know who's sitting over here, right? And so we talked through this whole thing and he asked me a bunch of questions. And he says, well, do you have anything you want to confess? 
And so I'm sitting there and, and I've, I've never been in this. I've never really been asked this question. I've never just point blank wrestled with like, what is it that I need to confess? And so sometimes, you know, just my personality, when I get uncomfortable, I, I just make jokes, right? And so I say to him, I say, I've cheated on every religion class I've taken at this school. And he starts kind of chuckling on the other side and he says, well, God forgives you and so do I. Let's go back to class. And in his moment of grace, he was like, this kid's got no idea what he's doing. I'm gonna let him off the hook. And so we walked back to class. And as I left that and that experience at like 15 years old, kind of being forced with this question of like, what do you need to confess? My pride kind of began to rustle up. And I was like, well, first off, why do I need to, you know, confess to anybody but Jesus? And so I went and I found the scripture in 1 Timothy. And it says that there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the Christ Jesus. And I was like, yeah, so, so that's good. So I don't ever have to talk to anybody about that again. And I remember going and talking to my youth pastor and saying, you know, like, I didn't like that. I don't want to ever have to do that again. And he said, well, have you ever read the book of James? He says, because in the book of James, it says that we need to confess our sins to each other so that we may be healed and the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I thought, okay. And so I started wrestling with this idea of like, what does it mean for us to really confess and let go of what is wrong, let go of what is bad, let go of the things that are not of God, let go of the things that are evil and to grab hold of the things that are good. And so as I wrestled with that, my perspective shifted over the years. And as I began to work this discipline, I realized that um, I don't have to confess, but I actually get to do that. And when we do that, we actually begin to find freedom from some things in our lives. And we begin to be set free to go forth and to live differently on the other side of that. Now, there's, there's a lot of divisive things in our culture right now. But one thing I think that almost everybody could probably agree on is that we don't like being wrong. Like nobody wants to be wrong, right? We don't want to be wrong because we want to be right. It reminds us of our failings. It reminds us that we're not as good as we picture ourselves to be. It reminds us that, you know, in some ways, and this may sound a little weird at first, but it reminds us that, you know, we're not God. And we have to wrestle with that. And what happens for some of us is when we can never admit wrong, the consequences of that begin to grow over time. And one of the worst things that begins to happen when we're unable to confess, when we're unable to admit our wrongs, when we're unable to go back and make the wrong things right, is we begin over time to redefine things in ourselves. And we get so used to living in the wrong that we begin to call the wrong right. And we can get so off base and we can go so far down the wrong path sometimes that it becomes a challenge for us to really begin to distinguish what is right and what is wrong. And we become masters of justification. And so we have to ask ourselves this question as followers of Jesus. We have to say, is our end goal to prove ourselves right or to be right with God? I think that's a big question for some of us. Because if we have a hard time going back and saying where we were wrong and correcting course and submitting to God's ways, then we can get into a really difficult pattern where we're continually working to prove ourselves right, to justify our actions above really seeking to be right with God. And so this idea of confession, it allows us to let go of the bad and grab hold of the good. And when we properly understand this discipline, we realize that we actually find freedom, not failure, in admitting our mistakes. Now, St. Augustine, he was one of the early church fathers, and he has this great line about confession. He says, confession of our wrong works is the first steps towards our good works. And so in every decision, we have a decision. And we get to choose which path are we going to go down in that. And he says, when we choose this path of confession, it actually opens the door for us to begin moving down the right path. And so this path of good works, he says, And so this fruit of the spirit that we've been working through these last few weeks, if you're just jumping in on this series with us, we've been calling it the next right thing. And we've been looking at the fruit of the spirit and how do we live those out? This love, we've talked about joy, we've talked about peace and patience and kindness. And today we're going to talk about goodness. And what does that look like? And what does that mean when we begin to bear this fruit of goodness as we seek to do the next right thing? Now, a quick definition of goodness would be to say that we are pure in heart that we have pure intention and we have purity in our direction and we're moving in this way of Jesus. And in spite of this tug of war in our soul between our flesh and the things that we want to do and our selfish desires and this way of Jesus, that good is when we can make decisions based purely on this way of Jesus. That those are good things. Those are good choices. Those are good paths forward. 
And so as we talk about this word good, we see the New Testament writers, they emphasize this word over and over and over again. And in Romans chapter 12, right? Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes that God is able to bless us abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that we need, we will abound in every good work. Galatians 6, one of my favorite passages of scripture, he says, let us not become weary in doing good. In 2 Thessalonians, he says, never tire of doing what is good. In the book of Titus, the first three chapters, he just uses this word over and over and over again in this idea of being pure in our decisions, pure in our intentions towards the things and the way of Jesus. And he says to love what is good, to teach what is good, to do what is good, to be eager to do good, to be ready to do good, to devote ourselves to doing good. And this whole idea of letting go of what is wrong and grabbing hold of what is right, letting go of what is evil and clinging to what is good and clinging to the things in this way of Jesus. And so when we talk about good works, if you've been around the church for a while, you'll see conversations begin to rumble up about this idea. Because one of the things that is so central to our theology is this idea that we are made right with God through Jesus Christ by faith, by grace, period right? Like that's the end. And that's how we're made right with God. And we see Paul talk a lot about this in his letters. And in Ephesians chapter two is one of the places where we see him say it most clearly that we could not be right with God by any of our good works. There's nothing we can do to be good enough to earn salvation. But it doesn't end right there, right? He keeps going in Ephesians chapter two, he says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, period. Right there, right? I'm with you. It is by grace, through faith, alone, so that no one can boast. And then in verse 10, Paul keeps going. And just as important as that to him, I think is verse 10. And he says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And now you see the same idea in Titus chapter three. He says, but when the kindness and love of God, our savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. Again, by grace through faith. And then you move down to chapter to verse eight. And he says, this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. So yes, it is absolutely by grace through faith. And once we get that, we begin to live in response to that grace. And the response to that grace is this overflowing of good works in the way that we choose to live our lives. And that's this whole idea, the fruit of the spirit, right? We encounter God. We encounter the reality of the gospel. We encounter the reality of who Jesus is in this way of Jesus that we're being called to. And when we submit ourselves to that relationship with Jesus, and when we receive all that comes to us in the gospel by grace, by faith, We begin to live in awe of that and the natural response to that is that we go and we let go of all that is evil and we cling to and we pursue all that is good. And that's the fruit that starts to come out of our lives. And we start to see that. A.W. Tozer, he has this great quote. He says, the more we know God, the more we will desire to translate the newfound knowledge into good deeds of mercy towards a suffering humanity. It's like once we get it, once we see that, it's that cycle of grace. Like when we've received it, man, we just want to give it. And we realize that there is a better way than our selfish desires. And we want to submit ourselves to that way of Jesus. And when we begin to do that, we begin to live differently. Our lives begin to look different. We we begin to let go of selfish desires and cling to the things of God. And so what is God's will for us? And as we walk through this series, right, the title of it, Do the Next Right Thing, right, somehow gives us a glimpse into this idea. And we live in an area that has a lot of transition, a lot of people coming and going, making big decisions, especially in this season of so much disruption, right? That question comes up over and over, like, what is God calling us to do? Where is God calling us to be? And I think in this season, one of the things that we can do to seek God's will for our lives more than anything else is that we can get as close to Jesus as we possibly can. 
that we spend time in our disciplines of prayer, that we dig into the scriptures, that we begin to surround ourselves with people who are pushing us down that path and that we work intentionally to let go of all that is wrong and grab hold of all that is right and do the next right thing. And we may not have some big master plan that's going to get us through the end of the year. We may not have some big master plan that's going to you know, solve all the complexity that we're dealing with right now. But what does it look like for us to get dead serious about the right here, the right now, and choose to do what's right in front of us and to grab hold of that good at every opportunity that we are given? You see, I think God's will for us is to stay as close to Jesus as we can and to do the next right thing. And so we have to make decisions about how we're going to live our lives. In light of the grace that God has shown us, it is by grace, by faith. In light of the hope and the freedom we receive the gospel, how are we going to live? What is it that we're going to be known by? What is it that we're going to be marked by? Are we going to hate what is evil and cling to what is good? Because if we hate it, we're going to do everything we can to eliminate it. And so church, do we have the courage to name the places where we have gotten off course? Do we have the courage to look back over this last season and see some patterns that have begun to emerge in our lives that don't look like Jesus at all? And do we have the courage to just name them and to cut them off and to let go of that way of talking to each other, to let go of that way of interacting with each other, to let go of that way of making decisions, to let go of all of those things and to grab hold to what is good and to live trusting in the grace and the faith that comes to us through Jesus? And so I think the big, the big challenge in that, right, is to say, okay, how do we let go of some of these things? And I think that comes back to this idea of confession. And it comes back to this place of getting real with ourselves, of getting real with God, of getting real with each other, and getting real with those around us and saying, these are some places where I have missed the mark and I have pursued things that are not of God. And I'm going to get real about that. And I'm going to let go of those things. I'm going to confess those things. And I'm going to maybe even seek to go and to make some things right. And so I don't know what that is for you, but I hope that as we prayed a few minutes ago that God's just been stirring in you a little bit and that there's maybe a situation or a circumstance that you know your selfish desires, your impulsive behavior has responded and reacted in a way that's maybe started to form some new patterns and we just need to cut that out. And so what does it look like? Maybe that's your spouse and you just need to come back and say, hey, I'm sorry for what I said in quarantine, right? Right? Maybe you need to go back to your kids and you're going to say, sorry for the way that I've been reacting and not responding. I'm sorry for the times where I should have been graceful and I wasn't. Maybe you need to go and call some school administrator on the phone and be like, sorry for all those things I said to my friends about you in emails when you were making really hard decisions. And maybe you need to go back to Publix and just apologize to everyone, right, for that trip that you had there. And we need to look back at those things and be real about them and say, I was wrong. And say, I don't want to be that. And so I'm going to let go of that. And I'm going to confess that. I'm going to apologize that. I'm going to seek forgiveness in that. And I'm going to move forward pursuing nothing but the good. And I'm going to reorient and I'm going to redirect. And I'm going to get back to that true north that God is calling me to. And that I know through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm capable of living a life that leads to transformation, that leads to blessing, that leads to change everywhere we go. So what do we want to be marked by? Who do we want to be known as? And if we're followers of Jesus, and if we're receiving that free grace, by grace, through faith, how are we going to live in response to that? And what does it look like for us right now to let go of some things and to cling to and to grab hold of what is good as we push forward in this season together? So let's pray. Jesus, we ask that you would be with us. God, we ask that you would... um, expose to us some places and some things in our lives that are not right. And I pray, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would give us the courage to confess and to seek to make those wrongs right. And God, we don't do that as works, but we do that in response to the grace upon grace upon grace that you have shown to us. In this season of so much complexity, so much rapid change, so much stuff that doesn't seem to be going the way that we want it to, God, when we respond in our flesh, would you just check us on that? Would you empower us to make that right, to let go of those selfish desires, to let go of those things that we just want in the moment, but would we grab hold of a higher way? 
that we'd grab a hold of a better way and that we would cling to you and we'd cling so close to you through prayer, God, that we would stay so close to you as we dig into your word and seek direction in every situation and in every circumstance and that we would pursue nothing but what you would have for us in this season. So God, give us the courage and the strength to do the next right thing. We want to be people marked by goodness. We want to be people who are marked by pursuing those things in light of the grace that you have so freely given to us. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.